Welcome to the Capital Forum's sixth annual Antitrust Thought Leaders interview series, hosted by Kale Discovery. My name is Karina Lubel, and today I'm joined by Anne McGregor. Anne is a national partner in Deckert's Brussels office. So Anne, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me, Karina. Uh, in light of your 25 years of experience in Brussels as both an antitrust practitioner and journalist, um, it seems that you'd be really well placed to talk about some trends in European merger enforcement. So I was hoping we could do that today. Uh, sure. First, maybe if we could talk about some statistics. My understanding is that Deckert has recently published some statistics on merger investigations. So could you talk about some of those? Sure. We have at Deckert been collecting data on the duration of merger investigations, both in the US and in the EU, for a number of years in the US. And in January, when we were releasing our data for 2017, for the first time, uh, at the beginning of 2018, we've included data for the EU. And that data shows some quite interesting trends in the duration of uh, what we call significant uh, merger investigations, both in the US and in the EU. Um, so what we see if we look at just the 2017 data is that uh, difficult or complicated cases, both in the US and in the EU, are taking longer than they've ever taken before. So in the data we released at the end of January, US investigations took an average of 10.8 months. So we're talking investigations which had some element of complication so that we would, you would end up with uh, an agency press release at the end of the process. Um, those cases, for all of those that were concluded during the 2017 year, they had a duration of 10.8 months. If we then look at the significant EU cases, and by those we mean those cases which were phase one with a remedy or went into phase two and concluded with some sort of decision or were withdrawn in a phase two, then we see that the phase one cases for 2017 took an average of seven months and the phase two cases took an average of 15.1 months. Now what we're including there is from the date of deal announcement to the date of the commission decision or the date of withdrawal if the case didn't proceed in the end. Um, and in Europe you have to remember that we have a long period of pre-filing discussions with the European Commission um, that you don't have in the US and not a lot of people understand that fully, but it, that can be a very significant amount of time. In a, in a complicated case that can be six, seven, eight, nine months sure. and that's not shrinking. And if we look at data across the last four, five, six years, we see that both in the US and in the EU, that duration really was an all-time high when we look at our 2017 statistics. If we then just look at the first quarter for 2018, you see just based on the more limited data set for three months for cases concluded in those three months, that in fact the statistical averages are down slightly. Mm. So we may be starting to see that cases are speeding up slightly. I think it's fair to say that in the US, those cases that began after uh, President Trump um, took office are probably being resolved slightly more quickly. Um, but you know, it's a limited data set, so how statistically significant it is is really hard to say. Uh, and in Europe, we've had um, a few cases resolved, uh, significant cases resolved in quarter one of 2018, which you know, those also show that they were slightly quicker on average than data for the whole of 2017. I think the big takeaway message for businesses really is that if you are doing a deal which has, you know, antitrust issues where you're going to need a remedy, where you may end up um, in litigation if you're in the US, you have to factor in a lot of time. And you know, it's not, these days it's not only the period of time in the EU and the US. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really about all your other jurisdictions. A lot of these global deals these days have filing requirements in 20, 25 or even 30 jurisdictions sure. and coordinating all of those and bringing in the clearances to be able to close when you want to close. You know, that's, that's a major operation. Um, and you know, it's not enough to say, oh, you know, an EU phase two case has a timeline of 90 working days. That's not the end of the story. You have to add phase one onto that. You have to add this pre-filing, what we call the pre-notification period, the discussion period of the European Commission into that. Um, and so, you know, when you're factoring in how, you know, at the very beginning when you're negotiating your transaction, 
how do I, um, you know, decide on, you know, my long stop date? When are we going to, you know, try to close this transaction? You have to be realistic about antitrust risk, where you've got a file, and how you're going to get to that end game. And you don't want to be, you know, having to, you don't want to put a too early a date in your transaction agreement and have to change it because that's going to obviously spook the market as you move that date out. Sure. So what you really need to do is be doing a lot of upfront work early on yeah. to understand. And based on this data, you can really see that, you know, on the whole, there over the last three, four, five, six years, it's only been, you know, the timeline has only been getting longer. And do these data track or isolate um, deals that are subject to review in both the U.S. and Europe, or do they also look at national, uh, or I guess sort of purely European deals or purely, purely U.S. deals? Well, some of the deals that are, uh, we look at all, for the European data, we're looking at all of the cases that had a European Commission decision. Now, some of those cases may only have been notified in Europe, they may have been purely European. Mm -hmm. Some of them will have been notified in multiple jurisdictions, including the US. So there is some overlap, so it's, sometimes it's the same case in both that. But you know, they're not always resolved uh, at the same time. That's what I was going to ask, is <laughs> so, whether that know, shows yeah. us that they're really being investigated in parallel and uh, receiving decisions uh, on the, the investigation, the outcome of an investigation in parallel. I mean, I think and, uh, the timelines of the, and the procedures in all the different jurisdictions vary so greatly that mm -hmm. if you're doing a major global deal with 20 or 25 or 30 antitrust clearances required, they're going to come in one after another and some are going to come in early in the, in the piece and others are going to come in late. And there will be other juris you know, some um, jurisdictions which will be looking to the major jurisdictions such as the EU and the US um, you know, and taking their lead. There might be a remedy negotiated or a commitment given in one jurisdiction which then um, is broad enough to solve the concerns in another jurisdiction, mm -hmm. you know, uh, so that then those, you, sometimes when you see the EU clear a big deal, you then see in the, you know, few days afterwards or a couple of weeks afterwards, you see a number of other jurisdictions say, oh yes, we can clear it now too. Okay. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it, they're never all, it's, it's really impossible to get them all to come in together. Sure. It's a process. Okay. I, since you, you brought up remedies, and that's something else I'd like to talk about, um, We've obviously seen uh, a signal from U.S. Uh, leadership of the, the U.S. Uh, enforcement agencies uh, that they'd like to rely less on behavioral remedies. Um, my understanding that that is still very much alive in Europe, and I'm just wondering if there's any concern among the defense bar as to uh, whether that could complicate things for emerging parties when it comes to remedies and global deals. Well, I think that in Europe, there's always been, just as there has been in the US, a clear preference for structural remedies. We have a guidance notice from the Commission on Remedies, which dates from 2008. And if you look at that, that's one of the principles right up front in the notice, that structural remedies are always preferred. Because preserving competition is about preserving the structure of the market. So a structural remedy is always going to be a better solution than some type of uh, other remedy, which um, you know has to perhaps be monitored, um, you know, and is less uncertain for the future. Um, but there, in the same commission notice also acknowledges that in some situations it's appropriate to give a behavioural remedy, uh, you know, and that might, be, that might be enough to solve the competition concern. So I don't think that the European Commission would want to throw away the possibility of you know, having something other than a structural remedy if it is appropriate in the circumstances. But there are certain hurdles you've got to cross with any remedy to show the regulator that it's going to do the job. Sure. So, it, you know, we have seen, and this is all in the public domain, it's been a lot of press reports just in the last few days, with the Biomonsanto transaction that the EU cleared that uh, at the end of March and one of the remedies given was that Bio was going to license to BASF it's digital agriculture business. Um, now we've seen just in the last few days press reports about what's happening with the Department of Justice in the US on the same case. And in fact, um, Bayer has decided to divest that same business rather than just licensing it because of what the DOJ, because of its discussions with the DOJ. And so that means now that um, the Bayer has had to go back to the European Commission and say, hello, can we change the remedy? Uh, and the European Commission has now released a statement saying, yes, you can, because 
you know, your amendments to the remedy are going to do the job at least as well as what you originally proposed to us and what we originally accepted when sense. we cleared it. So that, I think, is the first time we've really seen that. I can't actually remember another case where you've seen a remedy given to the Commission amended because of what's happened in another jurisdiction, but, you know, it's all ended well. So, so do you think then that going forward, uh, parties to merging parties uh, to, for global transactions will look more towards the U.S. focus on structural remedies and maybe even um, rather than propose some sort of license or some sort of behavioral remedy in Europe goes straight to the, the structural remedies or is there still going to be an attempt to see whether they can get clearance in Europe on something behavioral? Well, I think you, you know the new the the new administration here has, has made its preference clear, and if the the remedy concerned is just about solving a competition concern specifically in the u s perhaps you might still have a behavioral remedy that solves a specifically european problem that i don't mm. rule that out but I, I mean I do think there are some lessons to be learned um, and if you are thinking about possible mm. remedies and knowing that you know, perhaps the DOJ and the FTC would rather not have a behavioural remedy, then you would have to be prepared that, you know, you might have to go that extra mile. I think there, you know, it really, everything is case by case. Sure. Let, let's talk about cooperation between uh, the US and European antitrust enforcers a little more generally. Um, have you observed any changes since the, the, the Trump administration came on in the level of cooperation between the agencies? And if so, I'm just curious in what, what areas? I don't think there have been, uh, there's been any lessening of cooperation. I think over the last several years, the major antitrust agencies around the world, not just the European Commission and the DOJ and the FTC, but other major agencies as well, have been cooperating with each other more and more. And when you have a transaction which is notified in a number of jurisdictions, um, the agencies are in touch early, often before they've even received the filings. And you know, in these really big transactions, you have the case teams in Europe and the staff in, say, the DOJ or the FTC talking to each other, often on a weekly basis. You sometimes even have staff flying back and forth across the Atlantic to talk to each other in person about what's going on. And that also works up through the hierarchy up to even the level of you know, the European Commissioner and so forth. So uh, those, that cooperation is strong. There are a lot of relationships between the agencies and, and uh, I don't think that uh, uh, there's any lessening of that. One area where it seems there might be some tension is the, the Trump administration has made allegations in some, that some European Commission decisions have been politically motivated in that they aim to disadvantage a U.S. company um, with respect to its rivals uh, through antitrust enforcement. Um, have, you, have you observed any sort of tension between the agencies as a result of, of these allegations? I haven't observed any tensions between the agency, but I do think that this is sort of a perennial allegation which comes back almost annually um, because, uh, you know, when the European Commission takes a decision against a Silicon Valley company or another company which perhaps started off and is based or, you know, its headquarters are in the US uh, and there's some action taken against them in Europe, that's, we hear that. I mean, that's not a new allegation. But, you know, at the end of the day, these, a lot of these companies are global, they're multinationals, they have subsidiaries established in a number of member states in the EU, they are selling their products and services all over the EU, uh, they are active on markets in the EU, and if competition is disrupted or distorted, then our EU European Commission and our national member state competition agencies are perfectly entitled to intervene and deal with what's happening in their markets. And that's really all it's about, you know, that's sure. all it's about. Okay, now that makes a lot of sense. Um, well, that actually concludes our interview today, uh, but thanks so much for joining us, Anne, this morning to talk about some trends in European merger enforcement. Thanks, Karina. <laughs>